Amen. As you can see on the screen, we're in a series right now. We began it last week. It's very, very simply entitled Moving Forward. Everybody say Moving Forward. I'm talking about this right now because that just happens to be the season that we find ourselves in as a church. We are moving forward. We are now one church in two locations. Amen. Uh, our borders have enlarged. Our family is growing, and I don't know about you, but I'm excited about it. You know, just to keep everything in perspective, I think sometimes whenever, you know, on Sunday morning you don't see some of the team here, and maybe some of the people are not here, they're over visiting the Lafayette campus right now, uh, you know, whatever the case may be, John and Britt are here, you can kind of, you know, kind of lose perspective of the thing. John reminded me of this this week. He said, Dad, do you realize that if you took the number of people that we had in our services last week at our campus and you took the number of people who were in service last week at your campus, we are actually, we were actually over 100 people larger. We had one, over 100 more people in service with us this Sunday than we did the same time last year. Wow. How I many know that's a, that's a good way of looking at it? Isn't that right? And we also had more, uh, you know, fresh starts and just everything that goes with it. And so we are very, very thankful for that. But moving forward, as I said last week, if you weren't here, is really a theme that runs throughout the entire Bible. And the reason it does is because it's God's will, it's God's desire that we always be moving forward, that we always be making progress, that we always be entering into new and better things in our life, both as individuals and also obviously as a church. And I thought about the scriptures. Really, I really think it was kind of the Holy Spirit just reminded me of these, you know, phrases that are in the word that sometimes we often quote, and I don't know if we really realize they're just really all about moving forward. But the Bible says that we go from glory to glory. Isn't that right? Yeah, moving forward. We go from faith to faith, moving forward. We go from strength to strength. Yeah, I, I like that idea. How about you? I like all that. And then Jesus actually said that we go from being fruitful to being even more fruitful. And in my life, I want all those things to be realized. I, you know, and as, our, as a church, I want all those things to be realized. I really want the part about being even more fruitful to be something that we all realize or just something so fulfilling and exciting about being more and more fruitful. I don't think those are really all the qualities that always characterize many of God's people. And for that matter, I don't think those are qualities that always characterize every church because I don't, you know, there are a lot of people, just fact of the matter is that there are a lot of people, there are a lot of churches that very simply don't continue to move forward. Somewhere along the way, they get stuck. Have you ever been stuck? Man, I don't know about you, but I don't like being stuck. I don't like being stuck in the natural. I uh, got a pickup stuck here a while back and uh, so frustrating, wanting to go somewhere, needing to do something, but I am stuck. And then, uh, you know, there's been a time or two when, one, you know, we only had one vehicle available and my wife is somewhere and I am stuck at home when I want to, come on. Man, I don't like being stuck at home for very long. I mean, cash can only hang out so long, man. And then I got to go do something, but I am stuck at home. I took care of that, though. I went and got me a bicycle. If she's gone, I just ride my bike to town. Yeah, come on. I guess I could get on the lawnmower. I, you know, there's always, if there's a will, there's a way. Isn't that, isn't that right? Yeah. So there's all kinds of reasons why we get stuck. And I thought about some of those. You know, for instance, a challenge arises that we just simply won't address in our life. You know, if you've got a challenge uh, in your marriage that you're not addressing, you're not going to move forward in your marriage. You're not going to move forward in your marriage until you do. If you've got, you know, a challenge that's arising uh, in your finances and you're not willing to address it, you're not going to move forward. It's not going to get any better financially until you're willing to address the issue. I think we also often get stuck. I've sure seen this in relationships. I've seen this at the church because the church is all about relationships, but we get hurt. We could become offended somewhere along the way. We're not moving forward. You're not moving forward until you get over yourself, until you get over being hurt, until you forgive and get over the offense, come on, and decide you're going to move on. I think sometimes we 
uh, get stuck because we experience some kind of a personal failure in our life, and then we just refuse to get up and try again. What's the use? I can't do this. You can, if you, but you got to get up. You, the Bible says the just man falls seven times, and he just keeps getting up again and again. Come on. Uh, we stop putting forth the effort that's required in some area of our life in order to move forward. When we stop putting forth that effort, we just kind of, you know, do, go through the motions, continue the status quo. Things probably aren't going to get any better. I think often the price of moving forward becomes greater uh, than we're willing to pay. I see that very often in people's lives. They want to move forward, but there's a price involved And that price is obviously greater than they're willing to pay because they won't pay it. That's happened in our church where uh, we really had to count the cost of moving forward because we knew that in doing so, it was going to upset the apple cart somewhat. And uh, there was a good chance that we were going to lose some people along the way because they liked the way we were doing things. They liked the status quo. They liked it was good. The status quo was good. And we knew that moving, uh, changing things might mean uh, that we lost a few people. So we've had to count the cost. How many of you are glad you have a pastor who will move forward even when there is a price to pay? Come on. Yeah, because we always want to move into what God has for us. And then I think we often just get stuck in a moment. And when I say that, it's not necessarily a bad moment. I think we always think, oh, I got stuck in a moment. It's a bad moment. But I watch, and I think people are just as guilty or just as apt to get stuck in a good moment because things are good. Things are comfortable. You know, why change anything? Come on, you know what I'm talking about? But how many of you have ever heard the quote, good, things are good. Good is the enemy of best, and good is certainly the enemy of better. If you're satisfied with good, things are never really going to get any better. So often, we end up stuck in places that God only intended for us to pass through. I talked to you about that last week. We just get stuck in a place that God knew we would go through, but that's exactly what he intended for, to do. He intended for us to go through it with his help, by his grace. And so we talked about how there's a habit that we need to develop that'll keep us from getting stuck. It's a habit that'll keep us moving forward, and it is the habit of facing forward. And the habit of facing forward, as I said last week, is the habit of looking forward. Not looking back, but looking forward. We tend to look back thinking forward, not thinking about what was, but thinking about what God has promised and what can be as we move forward. And then the habit of talking forward and living forward and doing that at all times, no matter uh, what life may bring. And it really is, if you think about it, it's how we're supposed to live as people of faith. How can you live by faith and be looking in the past? looking in the rear view mirror. You can't do that, can you? If you are living by faith, you are always going to be facing forward to the victories that God has that he wants you to experience to the place that he's wanting to bring you into. And there's a great example of someone who knew and understood and lived by the habit of facing forward. And it's the Apostle Paul. And in Philippians 3, verses 12 through 15, he says, not that I've already obtained all this. In other words, I haven't arrived. How many of you haven't arrived either? Yeah. Or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on. Everybody say, I press on. I keep moving forward, in other words, to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold or has taken hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, the NLT, the New Living Translation says, I'm single-minded about this. Forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead. And the Passion Translation words it this way. I forget all of the past, good and bad. I forget all the past as I fasten my heart to the future instead. I love that. Paul goes on, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. And then he says this, all of us then who are mature should take uh, such a view of things. And if on some point you think differently, that too God will make clear to you. So he says, if you're going to live as a mature believer, this is the way you ought to think. And this is the habit you ought to have as a follower of Christ. You ought to have the habit of facing forward. 
And then in Philippians chapter 3, out of the Passion Translation, verse 16, it says, and let, all, and let us all advance together to reach the victory prize following one path with one passion. And I read that because that's my desire for us as a church, that we would all advance together. I don't want to leave anyone behind. I don't want to leave someone back here stuck, you know, and just, I, you know, I want to do whatever I can to help keep people face forward, look forward, think forward, come on, talk forward, move forward, so we can all together experience what God has for us in the future. Amen? So let's be a people of faith, and let's be a people, let's be a church that is always facing forward. Today, I want to talk to you about transitions. Everybody say transitions. And I want to talk to you about the role that they play in moving forward. This actually comes from a lesson that I just taught this last week in our leadership meeting. And uh, I was talking with my wife and John about the direction I was going to go this Sunday morning. And actually, I had kind of thought about going another direction. And my wife said, boy, I really feel like you need to share what you shared uh, in the leadership meeting. And then talking to John, John said, boy, Dad, I do too. So not that I'm led by my wife or led by my son. I am led by the Holy Spirit. But I thought, you know what? If they thought that and it meant that much to them, it helped them that much as leaders in the church, then I think it would probably help everyone else too. So that really is what this message is all about where it came from. Title of my message today is, I'm in transition. Come on. Everybody say, I'm in transition. Look at your neighbor and say, I'm in transition. Can I tell you, some of you are in transition and you don't even know it. So anyway, you'll, you'll see that as we share today. Transition, just so you know what I'm talking about, uh, because it's not a word that we use all the time, not something we think a lot about, but it's throughout the Bible, is the process or period of changing from one state or condition to another. The process or period of changing from one state or condition to another. And a transition is a season when you're moving from where you are to where you're going. You're changing from what you've been to what you're going to be. A transition is the land between. It's the land between what was come on, and what will be. And whether you realize it or not, as you study scripture, you discover that transitions are actually God's way of moving you from where you are now into what he has for you in the future. And when I say the future, I don't necessarily mean way, way off out there somewhere. I think you know, one thing leads to the next, but I'm talking about what I really do believe to be the very near future, the immediate future of, of where he's wanting to take you in your life. As I said, our church is obviously in a time of transition. God is in the process of changing us from what we were uh, to what we're going to be moving forward. We were uh, a church that met solely here in Danville. And how many know we are changing? We're in the process of changing from one church in one location to one church in two locations. And there's a transition involved in that. And you need to make sure you remember that as I'm talking today because uh, we, we are not where we were, but we are certainly not, uh, you know, where we're going to be moving forward. Uh, we're, we're in that in-between state. Some of you, I thought about this just to bring it home for all of us, are in a season of transition also. Some of you are actually in a uh, season of significant transition. I mean, you are going through significant change and uh, in some other area of your life. Things are no longer the way they were, uh, but they're not what they're going to be either. That's what uh, I want to tell you. If you're a child of God and you're living by faith, things may not, have, may not be what they were, but I want to assure you things are not what they're going to be as you continue to move forward with God, and that's what you want to do. So you're in transition, and God wants to use this season of transition to move you into what he has for you. He doesn't want you getting stuck and missing that. He wants to use this season of transition to take you from where you've been to where he desires for you to be. I thought about, and I talked about this in the leadership meeting, how that transitions, just so you understand this, are really a part and a common part of all of our lives. In fact, someone has said that life is one big transition. 
And if you think about it, it really is. It, and being a Christian is really all about, you know, one big transition. Because the moment you get saved, from that moment on, how many know God is always changing you, always doing a work on the inside of you that does bring you from glory to glory, from faith to faith, where you're more like Jesus than you were the day before, from strength to strength, where you're, you know, where you're experiencing one thing right now, but he's endeavoring to bring you into something even more and something greater. That, that's what keeps, to me, the Christian life exciting. If you're not moving with that, then no wonder uh, your life as a Christian is not everything you'd like for it to be. I thought about some of the transitions that we go through uh, as people, and for whatever reason, this must have been a uh, uh, significant transition in my life uh, because it's the first thing I thought about. Um, it, is, it was going from grade school to junior high. Or maybe in your case, from junior high to high school. But boy, was that a big transition for you. I was excited about it, but I was also nervous. I didn't know how I was going to be received. I didn't know what to do. I thought I'd, you know, I'd, I'd afraid I'd get lost. You know, what about when the bell rings? How do I know which class to go to? Come on. Are, are, none of you, that bo- didn't bother any of you. <laughs> Bothered the heck out of me. And so there was just a trend. But now I got used to it. I thought, no big deal. And I was as cool as anybody in there, huh? Uh, how about this one, leaving home to go to college? Man, I remember walking downstairs one day uh, in our house, and my son, oldest son, was on the edge of the bed just crying. And I said, Brock, what's wrong? And I thought, you know, he's probably done something wrong. He's afraid he's going to get in trouble. And uh, I said, what's wrong, bud? And he said, Dad, I'm just scared. <laughs> But there's some things you just remember, huh? And I said, you're scared, buddy. What are you scared of? And he said, Dad, just leaving home and, and going to, you know, he wasn't going any, but just to Ohio. It wasn't like he was going to the other side of the world, but he's going to Ohio. He's never been away from home like that, you know. And he's always, Dad's been there, you know. And he said, I'm just scared. Come on. You know what I'm talking about? But he made the transition, and he did it pretty well. Didn't take him long. Uh, How about becoming an empty nester? That was a transition my wife struggled with. I absolutely loved that transition. (laughs) Home, it's like heaven. There are no kids. But the bad thing is they come back. They come back. (laughs) Yeah, no, they don't come back. So anyway, well, mine didn't anyway. Uh, Getting married, boy, that was a transition. Come on. I mean, no, that wasn't everything you thought it was going to (laughs) be. Now, hopefully it's getting better. Yeah, I'm not saying it's not good, man. Ours went from went from bad to good to being really good. Just keeps getting better all the time. But there was a transition, getting to know each other. Whatever, you got it. Having your first child—that's a transition. Transition for mom. Transition for dad. You're not the focus of attention anymore, are you? A parent moving in. Boy, that's a trans uh, transition. Having an older parent move in with you. Uh, because they need your assistance and you know the roles kind of switch an older child moving back home with you because of going through a difficult time transition getting divorced and I'm not putting that after that because one happens after the other it's just the way I thought about them Uh, changes at your workplace Uh, I talked with somebody this week that's uh, one of our team leaders or actually a couple weeks ago about changes Very, very good at what she does but they're changing the way they approach a lot of things, the way they're doing a lot of things. And man, it, there's this transition right now and it's a little uncomfortable and you're they're, you know, trying to figure your way through it, navigate it, all right? Uh, moving, relocating, major change in businesses, retirement, the loss of a spouse. Those are all transition, transitions. Some of them not real significant, some of them very significant. And, you know, uh, we, we want to make them. We want to make them well. We tend to make a big deal out of transitions, but the reality is that, that they're common to life. And they happen anytime there's a change in our life. Life is filled with transitions. Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 1 says, There's a time for everything. Not some things, not most things. There is a time for everything and a season for every activity under the heavens. So in other words, what the writer is saying that one season is always moving towards another. Things are always changing. Nothing remains the same. Everything is always in transition. So since everything is always in transition, we'd be wise to understand that transitions are simply a part of life and learn how to navigate them well so that we can, uh, you know, get through them as smoothly and successfully as possible. Transitions are the bridge 
between what was and what is to come. A transition, as I said, is what moves us from one thing to the next. It moves us from where we are into what God has for us. Uh, and the Bible's filled with transitions. You look at uh, Joshua leading the people of Israel uh, from the wilderness into the promised land. That was a huge transition. I'm going to talk to you and read from there in just a moment. How about this transition? The transition from the resurrection of Jesus to the day of Pentecost. I mean, you think about that. Here is the resurrection of Jesus, and this church is actually established then. But the church isn't actually released and sent out until on the day of Pentecost. After they have waited there and with 120, you know the story, and the Holy Spirit falls on them, then they are sent out to go and do the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Isn't that right? So they're wild after the resurrection, waiting for the Holy Spirit to come. Man, they're in transition. They're, they're doing some waiting. They're, there's some uncertainty that's going on there. And uh, how about this one? How about, and this, I could have used any miracle. I chose this one. Do you remember the man laying at the gate beautiful? And uh, he's, uh, he's lame. He says, silver, and, and he comes through there and asking for alms. Or he's sitting there, he's, and I'm hurrying. Uh, he's sitting there laying at the gate beautiful, looking for alms. Peter comes through, Peter and John. He says, silver and gold have I none, such as I have given by thee in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Rise up and walk. And the Bible says he reached down, grabbed him by the hand, and lifted him up. And the Bible says the man went walking and leaping and praising God. There's a transition there. Can I tell you what the transition is? The transition is, in some ways, instantaneous. He goes from being a lame man to being a healed man. Glory. Is it all glory? Probably not. Because now this lame man who's been lame from his mother's womb is a healed man. He's a whole man. And he's going to have to join the rest of society in doing what whole people do and going out, finding him a job, and making him a living. So all of a sudden, there is a transition that is going on there. So a transition is a bridge between the past and the future. When you're in transition, you're not where you were, but you're, not, you're also not where you're going. And transitions get us there. And see, I think a lot of times when we don't understand transitions, we don't realize how much they're a part of life, then we tend, we tend to not move with them like we need to. We don't, we don't recognize them. Sometimes we think it's the devil. The devil's just trying to mess my life up. No, sometimes life is just happening, baby. It's just life. Come on. And uh, you're in transition. And I've seen people, I've seen churches actually that will, because they don't understand they're in transition, they'll actually resist the transition. Oh, you know, because the, it, we're, they're, what they're doing is they're trying to keep things the same. Because they like the same. They're familiar with the same. The same is good to them. And God says, don't care how much you liked it. Don't care how familiar you are with it. I have something new. Behold, I'm doing something new. I have something more. I have something greater that I'm endeavoring to lead you into. Amen? Amen. Uh, so people don't always navigate transitions well because... They're all about change, and we don't like change. They're, they're unfamiliar, they're, they're uncomfortable, and they're by nature filled with some uncertainty. Anytime you're moving into the future, the future is always filled with at least a measure of uncertainty. I don't care how much you're going after the promise of God. When you're going after the promise of God, there's a lot of uncertainty. Amen? You're going to face giants, some that you expect, but how many know you're also going to face some giants that you just didn't even know uh, were going to be a part of things? Amen? And so they can be awkward uh, because you've never been there before, so you're having to try to figure them out, and you're, endeavor, you're having to try to navigate through them. So uh, transitions take us out of our comfort zone, and people often, I think, get lost in a time of transition. Can I tell you something else that also happens? The enemy absolutely loves when we're in a season of transition because he can go to work. Come on. He can go to work in that time. He can, you know, bring all kinds of confusion in there. He can make us think, you know, that, you know, things aren't ever going to work out. Come on, you know what I'm talking about? And, uh, you know, he can just... He just, he absolutely loves whenever we're kind of walking in the dark, when we're living by faith, because he takes advantage of those moments. 
my daughter-in-law sent me over a podcast when she found out I was going to teach on this. She said, you're not going to believe this. Stephen Furtick just taught on transitions this week. And uh, he said, you might want to go listen. She said, you might want to go listen to it. So I did. And it's called Trapped in Transition. And in his message, he talks about how uh, he met with a security company that, uh, you know, that was going to put security in their building. And so they're trying to figure out the best places to put it. And here's what the security company said that I thought was so very good. The most important place to make sure there is plenty of security is anywhere there is transition because where there's transition, there's distraction. And where there's distraction, you think about a busy hall, whatever, there's distraction. And anywhere there's distraction, there's opportunity for someone who means harm to capitalize on the moment and to create instability. And transition, while it's the path to opportunity to the future, it's, all the, it's also the place of distraction and some instability, which leaves us vulnerable to the enemy. So we got to be alert and we got to be aware. Amen? You know, can I tell you, as a church... Um, as I said, we're in a season of transition, so you know there's a little bit of distraction, there's a little bit of instability. You know, people are aware of the fact that you know uh, some of the team is not here uh, every Sunday. As I said, John and Britt are over there uh, a lot right now. We'll go back and forth in the future, but right now they're over there a lot, and so you know people kind of miss uh, you know that miss John and Brittany being here uh, no more so than we do. Uh, but boy, come on, the enemy, if we're not real careful, how many know the enemy can use what we're grieving the loss of? Come on, to throw us off track. It, the grieving of that loss distracts us from where God is endeavoring to take us. Hmm. Amen. Just bring that over into your own life. When you're in transition, I will assure you the enemy is going to endeavor to, to distract you and get your focus off of forward movement, off of what God has for you, and get you to focusing on, come on, what's going on in your life that you don't like. So we're usually much too slow to respond to transition. I'll say that, and then I want to get into uh, what I want to wrap up with today. Um, I can prove to you that we are usually way too slow in recognizing when we're in a transition and moving with it. I have three kids. And they are, are they five years apart, babe, or are they six years apart, John? and I think they're six. Five or six, doesn't matter. So John, Brock was our first one. Alicia's our second one. And John was the third. I'd like to tell you that I got parenting figured out before any of them were born. But you know, I'd be lying because none of you got it figured out either. Because how many know while they do come with a manual in a general sense, the Bible tells us how to raise them up. How many know they're all different and you got to figure each one of them out? Yeah. And parenting your children, there's a lot of things you do that's the same. Can I tell you, there's a lot of things, there's a ways you, there are, your parenting has to be actually different with each kid. You got to know their temperament, their personalities. You can say one thing to one, it just motivates them. You can say it to the other one, and it can devastate them. I mean, you got to know, you know, what motivates them. Come on. And so I didn't get it figured out with Brock. No, not at all. Now, you'd thought if I got figured out, didn't get figured out with Brock, I'd sure get it figured out on the next one with Alicia. The only thing is, she was so easy, you know, it just, it, she was just crazy easy kid to parent. At least she was to me. Her mom might feel different, but, but I sure did. <laughs> so, by the time you get parenting figure out, figured out, <laughs> they're already leaving home. Come on. Yeah. And you're looking back thinking, boy, if I'd have just understood if I'd have just known, I'd do that differently. Can I tell you, what if you started viewing your transitions as God moving you from one place to the next, and rather than resisting it, and rather than doubting it, questioning it, whatever, what if you just decide, I'm going to put my faith in you, Father. I'm going to face forward, and I'm going to trust you to do exactly what you've promised to do. And I'm going to endeavor to move with you to the very best of my ability through this thing. And you're not going to get it all right even then. But how many know you're going to do a lot better with that attitude than you'll ever do with the wrong attitude and trying to resist it. Amen. So in Joshua chapter 1, verses 1 through 8, 
is, I think, one of the most significant transitions in all of the Bible. It's certainly one of the biggest transitions in all of the Bible. And I want to read Joshua 1 through 8 to you here in just a moment. Make a couple of points and then we'll wrap this up. But just to give you a little bit of background, Moses has died. That's a big deal because he's been the leader of the people, and led them out of Egypt's bondage. He's, you know, God's used him to call the 10 plagues uh, down upon Egypt and all that. Uh, he's used him to part the Red Sea, uh, manna, a water out of a rock. Come on, how many of you would not like to follow this guy? Come on. <laughs> And uh, so Moses has died, and the leadership mantle is about to... Is this okay? It doesn't matter. I'm almost through it anyway. So (laughs) the mantle's about to be passed to Joshua. So basically, God is looking at Joshua, and he goes, Hey, uh, Tag, you're it. And uh, according to custom, God has given the people 30 days to mourn. This is significant. He's given the people 30 days to mourn, to, to grieve the passing of Moses, their leader. And now that time has come to an end. And here's why I just focused on that for just a moment. Because grieving a loss, any loss, is normal. And God actually understands our need to grieve a loss. It's not that we grieve that is the issue. It's, the issue is, is how long we grieve. How many of you know some people who have never stopped grieving the loss of a spouse, never stop grieving the loss of a child, never stop grieving the loss of this great job they had, or, you know, I don't know, the last move of God in their church, you just figure it out, you know. But now it's time for the people to stop mourning, and it's time for them to begin to move forward, as I said, which is always God's plan uh, for his people. And so Joshua becomes responsible to to lead the people in this time of transition from the wilderness and into the promised land. And, you know, my role here has never changed. The the, the situation is not exactly the same, but the principles are the same here. And, uh, you know, my role as your uh, pastor, as your spiritual leader, is to get you from where we've been, which was good, to get you to where we are going, which is even better. He says, well, I can see this, and I like this. This sounds good, but how do you know? Well, it's called faith. Come on. If I had to know before I went, I'd never get to go because it wouldn't require any faith, and God's a God of faith. When he told Abraham, he said, hey, you follow after me, and I'm going to take you to a place where you don't know. You've never been there. And he says, it's a land that flows with milk and honey. That's all he gets. Come on. And he takes off on that journey of faith, having confidence in God. Amen? So listen to what God says to Joshua as he instills within him the mindset that's going to be needed to make this transition. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spoke to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant, saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. And it isn't God stating the obvious. Joshua knows that Moses is dead. He know, you know, I, I would assume that he knows that God's not going to raise him up from the dead while he might would like for him to in that moment. What he's actually doing is telling Joshua, hey, listen, what was is now no longer. That was the past, and this is the future. Things are different now. And they're never going to be the same again. And so we need to realize that as a church also. You need to realize that in your own life. Then he says, now therefore arise. Now is a transitional word. Now in this moment of time. Uh, Here's what needs to happen in order that God's promise can be realized. Because see, that's ha- that, while everything else around you may change, that hasn't changed. God's promise to us has not changed. And he tells Joshua to arise. I love that because really what he's doing is saying, he's saying, get up. Everybody say, get up. And he's telling him, you're going to have to posture yourself different 
if you're going to move forward. Listen, as a church, we got to posture ourselves correctly if we're going to move forward. As an individual, whatever your transition is, whether it's a, uh, a failed marriage, a, a new job, I, whatever it is, you're going to have to posture yourself correctly if you're going to move forward. You're going to have to get up. But you don't have, you're not just getting up physically and posturing yourself physically. You've also got to posture yourself mentally. You've got to begin to think right and you gotta be, you got to posture yourself emotionally. you got to get a control of your emotions. Isn't that right? Is this okay? And so if he's going to make the transition successfully, he's got to posture himself correctly. He says, go over this Jordan. Go over. Get to the other side. This Jordan. Jordan represents the very first challenge that they're going to face in making this transition and laying claim to the promised land. And that tells me that, you know, as we begin to make this transition, we're going to face some challenges. We've already faced challenges. Some you're aware of, some of them you're not aware of. You know, we've just, we've actually faced one challenge after the next. Somebody made this statement to me the other day and they said, well, when negative things like that happen, how do you know that's not God uh, trying to stop you? I thought you think just like every other religious Christian I've ever been around. <laughs> you act like just because this is God, it's all going to be good. It's all going to be easy. Well, if it was the Lord, it wouldn't be this hard. Where'd you get that? You didn't get it from the Bible. Because no matter what they did for God, they faced hell along the way. They had to fight giants along the way. That's how you get to the other side. We went into the challenge of there wasn't a building. Where are we going to meet? We're going to have church. We don't have a place. And John and Britt, me a little bit at the, near, near the, the end of it, uh, they got really worked up about that, as I understand that, because, you know, you want to tell folks where we're going to meet. I mean, that's, as a church, that's kind of important. <laughs> and their garage is big, but it ain't big enough. And they don't want to meet there, you know. And so they kind of got their heart set on one thing, and... You know, that didn't work out. Found another place, that didn't work out. But you know what? God had the right place all the time, right where he wanted us to be. And it's a blessing. I, you know, I don't have time. It's just a crazy blessing the way this all worked out. But there was a challenge, you know, and you, we had to keep walking by faith, not by sight, not getting discouraged, put one step in front of the other, make another call, go see another person. I'm believing God for my marriage to get turned around. You got any counseling? I don't want to go counseling. Really? You do believe in miracles. <laughs> because that means God is going to have to miraculously change you and your spouse. But the problem is, when he's done changing you, it ain't going to be long before you're right back in the same mess again. Because you didn't learn what you needed to learn to get you out of the mess you were in in the first place. The reason I never get through with my messages is because I'm constantly talking to somebody in here. <laughs> so anyway, everybody say, go over. Cross over. Yeah, don't get halfway across Jordan and think, what if this don't work? And make the, make the cross. Then listen to this. Every place that the, oh, I love it, God. I love this. Every place, every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I've given you. Doesn't feel like it. Doesn't look like it. Giants there sometimes. He says, that's okay. I've given you that. From the wilderness in this Lebanon, as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the high tides to the great sea toward the going down of the sun shall be your territory. So God is reminding him of the promise that he gave to Moses and he's reaffirming it to him because the promise remains the same. Amen? God is saying, listen, when you begin to move forward, I'm going to give you everything that I've promised you. Isn't it interesting that the promises of God go unrealized in our life until we step out and start taking steps of faith towards it? Amen? Amen? And then God begins to instill vision into Joshua by establishing the boundaries of 
his promise. And he talks about, you know, from here to there, you know. And I, I thought about when I was putting this together, I didn't talk about this Tuesday night, but whenever I drove over to Lafayette, somebody mentioned Lafayette to me in a conversation. This is how God works in me because I'm too dumb for him to do it other ways, I guess. It happens all the time. And, uh, and then the, another way he works in me is he has music play behind me that lets me know I need to hurry. <laughs> But so, anyway, so I drive, they say something and it sparks something in me because we, I, I know what I'm believing God for as a campus. And we, we had thought about somewhere else the whole time. When he says it, it just, mm. so I drove over there. I think Sheila and I drove over together. And we just drove around. And man, the, when I'm driving around, it's all of a sudden I just see this. I just see Lafayette as a place where we have church. You know what God's doing? He's still in, he's instilling vision into my heart for what he's wanting to do. I want to ask you something. What have you had God endeavor to instill vision into your heart for here lately? A better marriage, finances, more involvement in ministry. What is it that you had God endeavor to instill in your heart? What you see and what you focus on is what you move towards. Ever since the day that happened, that's what we've seen and that's what we've been focusing on. He goes on and says, no man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. I got you back, in other words. As I was with Moses, I'll be with you. Uh, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. Only be strong and take courage. Everybody say, be strong and of good courage. Say it again. Say it one more time. You know, that's, that's actually how many times God told Joshua in, in one setting. He told Joshua three times, be strong and of a good courage. Why is that? Because if you're going to make a transition, it takes strength and it takes courage. Amen. You can't listen to all the lies of the enemy or all of the negative stuff anybody else may be saying. It takes strength and it takes courage to keep moving forward to what lies ahead. I had some practical points for making the transition, but everything I've said been about as practical as I know how to be. And besides that, I'm practically out of time. <laughs> as you can tell, I'm very excited about what God is doing in our church. But I've done this for a long time, and so I'm very aware of where we are as a church in the mood of things and you know what we might be missing the people, it just doesn't look the same we, ha we haven't arrived yet don't judge us by what we look like right now we're, we're, we're just we're, we're in transition we're having to make some adjustments sometimes they're not all going to go just right sometimes it's you know it's going to take a little while Christians got to learn how to sing, man. I mean, just telling you right now, Christians got to learn how to sing. I'm going to give him some money for lessons this week. And come on. Then he needs to learn how to move with God. You know, it's just, it's just going to take some time. Come on, you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. And you know what? There's other things. There's just other things. The, is, is, is it going to be different? Move. It's going to be different. We didn't become what we were overnight before. Some of you just came in on the end of it though and you thought, oh, this is awesome. It wasn't awesome when we first made the change. It was not awesome at all. It was uncomfortable. It was unfamiliar. We, you think we suffered loss, just John and Britt going over there and a few team members going over there for a while helping out. You think we suffered loss? You weren't here almost nine years ago now, eight years for sure, whenever we made the big transition and we lost over half of our people and lost over 60%. In that half, we lost over 60% of our finances. Yeah. Yeah. Somebody said, boy, Pastor, I bet you got discouraged, didn't you? I, my wife is here. and She'll tell you. I, I got, at the end, I was getting a little nervous. I'm thinking, okay, God, come on. But I honestly knew this is what I'm supposed to be doing. This is the direction we're supposed to be going in. And this will change. And this is honest truth, and I'll close with this. I remember walking into the house. We were living next door to the church at the time, and the parsonage there. And I walked in one evening, and I said, you know what? I just got to realize, because, see, I'm, I'm always a little impatient, not like you aren't, I know. But I'm impatient. I don't mind transition as long as it happens tomorrow. <laughs> 
So I walked over and I just said, you know what, babe? I just need to realize this is going to take a little longer than I thought it would. That was in August of 2000 and uh, I think 12. And you know what? In October of 2012, this time, the same time of year as then, we took off and we started growing again and we grew. We didn't just get our number back. We grew to over twice as large as we had ever been in the history of our church. I <laughs> see some of you, you just came in on the end of that. So, oh, that's, that's what you know. Listen, there are going to be some folks, a few months, a couple years down the road, they're going to come in to the end of something we're doing then. And it's going to be bigger, better, better than, than even where we're at right now. Amen? But let's move forward. Let's move forward. Father, we love you.